Inanna and Dumuzi. How Dumuzi became the dying and rising god. Greetings, viewers. Today, we'll be exploring some ancient Sumerian myths centering around two important deities, the goddess Inanna and the god Dumuzi. These stories date back over 4,000 years to ancient Mesopotamia, but they contain timeless themes that still resonate today. The main myth we'll be looking at is called Inanna's Descent to the Netherworld. This epic tale depicts Inanna's journey to the underworld and how it led to the death and rebirth of her husband, Dumuzi. We'll also touch on two other myths, Dumuzi and Gestiana and Dumuzi's dream, which further detail how Dumuzi was captured by demons and brought to the netherworld. These stories illuminate the Sumerian worldview and provide insight into their mythology and religious beliefs. The changing seasons, agriculture, love, death, loyalty, dreams, all play integral roles. We'll discuss the major themes and symbolism at work in these myths and what they reveal about the Mesopotamian culture. Inanna stands out as a rare example of a powerful goddess figure in ancient mythology. The love between Inanna and Dumuzi provides a more human, relatable side to the deities. And Dumuzi's eventual death and resurrection foreshadows later dying and rising god archetypes who profoundly influenced many cultures. I hope this overview provides useful context for the analysis of the myths themselves. Let's dive into the incredible world of Inanna, Dumuzi, and ancient Sumer. Please subscribe and stay tuned for more mythological explorations. Inanna's Descent to the Netherworld From the great heaven, Inanna set her mind to the great below. My mistress abandoned heaven, abandoned earth, and descended to the netherworld. In ancient Sumerian mythology, Inanna stands out as a powerful, sexual, warlike goddess. Several stories describe her descent to the netherworld and how it ultimately affected her husband, the shepherd, Dumuzi. In one of the most famous myths about Inanna, she travels to the other side descending into the depths of the netherworld. We will join the goddess as she journeys to the land of no return and find out if she is able to make it back alive. As with many Sumerian myths, Inanna's descent to the netherworld goes all the way back to around 2000 BCE and contains over 400 lines of texts. Cuneiform tablets that contain the story have been found in different Sumerian cities, including the famous cities of Ur and Nippur. The story opens with Inanna setting her mind to go down to the netherworld. Although she has many cities and temples under her care, she abandons them all and prepares to make her way to the land of no return. She took the seven divine powers. She collected the divine powers and grasped them in her hand. With the good divine powers, she went on her way. Her minister, Ninshuber, began the journey with her, but was quickly sent on an important mission. On this day, I will descend to the underworld. When I have arrived in the underworld, make a lament for me on the ruined mounds. Beat the drum for me in the sanctuary. Make the rounds of the houses of the gods for me. Inanna instructs Ninshuber to perform mourning rituals for the goddess, just as one would do for the dead. They are then to go and petition the various gods on Inanna's behalf. Like a pauper, clothe yourself in a single garment and all alone set your foot in the Acor, the house of Enlil. When you have entered the Acor, the house of Enlil, lament before Enlil. Father Enlil, don't let anyone kill your daughter in the underworld. Don't let your precious metal be alloyed there with the dirt of the underworld. Don't let your precious lapis lazuli be split there with the mason's stone. Don't let your boxwood be chopped up there with the carpenter's wood. Don't let young Lady Inanna be killed in the underworld. But perhaps the god Inlil would not respond. If Nin Shuber's pleas were ignored, they were to travel to the temple of the god Nana in the city of Ur and plead Inanna's case. If Nana 
would not respond, Ninshuber was to travel to Eridu and see Inki and beg for help. It seems that Inanna knows that neither Enlil nor Nana will respond, as she tells Ninshuber. Father Enki, the Lord of Great Wisdom, knows about the life-giving plant and the life-giving water. He is the one who will restore me to life. Plant and water of life? Sound familiar? Hmm. Having instructed her minister, Inanna ventures to the netherworld, to the gates of the palace Ganzer. Open up, Dorman, open up. Open up, Netty, open up. I am all alone, and I want to come in. Netty, confused by Inanna's arrival, asks why she has made this journey. Because Lord Good Galana, the husband of my elder sister, Holy Ereshkigal, has died. In order to have his funeral rites observed, she offers generous libations at his wake. That is the reason. Unsure of what to do, Neti, the doorkeeper of the Netherworld, goes to Arishkigal, the queen of the Netherworld, to ask what should be done. My mistress, there is a lone girl outside. It is Inanna, your sister, and she has arrived at the palace Ganza. She pushed aggressively on the door of the Underworld. She shouted aggressively at the gate of the Underworld. She has abandoned Ayana and has descended to the Underworld. Ereshkigal instructs Neti to allow Inanna to enter, but to disarm her of her powers as she enters the Netherworld. Neti, the chief doorman of the Underworld, paid attention to the instructions of his mistress. He bolted the seven gates of the Underworld. Then he opened each of the doors of the palace Ganza separately. He said to Holy Inanna, Come on, Inanna, and enter. As she passes through each gate, however, she is required to remove an article of clothing as part of the rites of the underworld. After she had crouched down and had her clothes removed, they were carried away. Then she made her sister Ereshkigal rise from her throne, and instead she sat on her throne. The Inuna, the seven judges, rendered their decision against her. They looked at her. It was the look of death. They spoke to her. It was the speech of anger. They shouted at her. It was the shout of heavy guilt. The afflicted woman was turned into a corpse, and the corpse was hung on a hook. That's right. Inanna was killed for her actions, but it appears, as we saw earlier, that Inanna knew that she was likely to die in her journey to the netherworld. Her body was hung on a hook. After three days and three nights had passed, her minister, Ninshubo, carried out the instructions of her mistress. After three days and nights, Ninshuber sprang into action. They brought the message to Enlil, then to Nana, and finally to Inki. Father Enki answered Ninshubur, What has my daughter done? She has me worried. What has Inanna done? She has me worried. He removed some dirt from the tip of his fingernail and created the Kugara. He removed some dirt from the tip of his other fingernail and created the Galatora. To the Kugara, he gave the life-giving plant. To the Galatora, he gave the life-giving water. Inki then instructs his two creations, the Kurgara and the Galatura, to go and rescue Inanna. Flit past the door like flies, slip through the door like phantoms. The mother who gave birth, Ereshkigal, on account of her children, is lying there. When she says, Oh, my heart, you are troubled, our mistress, oh, your heart, when she says, O oh, my body, you are to say, You are troubled, our mistress, O oh, your body. She will then ask, Who are you? If you are gods, let me talk with you. If you are mortals, may a destiny be decreed for you. As we saw in the myth about Adapa and the South Wind, Inki again warns his creations against accepting food and drink gifts. They will offer you a river full of water. Don't accept it. They will offer you a field with its grain. Don't accept it. But say to her, whether it is that of our king, whether it is that of our queen, give it to us. She will give you the corpse hanging on the hook. One of you sprinkle on it the life-giving plant, and the other the life-giving water. Thus, let Inanna arise. The two creatures precisely obey Inki's instructions and apply the plant and water of life. And thus, Inanna arose. Having been brought back to life, Inanna attempted to flee the netherworld. But as Inanna was about to descend from the underworld, the Anuna seized her. Who has ever ascended from the underworld, has ascended unscathed from the underworld? 
If Inanna is to ascend from the underworld, let her provide a substitute for herself. Inanna could not simply leave the land of no return. She could only depart if she provided someone to remain in her place. Inanna is then escorted out of the netherworld under close guard by demons. Those who accompanied her, those who accompanied Inanna, no, no food, no, no drink, eat no flower offering and drink no libation. They accept no pleasant gifts. They never enjoy the pleasures of the marital embrace, never any sweet children to kiss. They tear away the wife from a man's embrace. They snatch the son from a man's knee. They make the bride leave the house of her father-in-law. Holy Inanna first approaches her faithful minister, Ninshuber, who throws herself on the ground in front of Inanna. She had sat in the dust and clothed herself in a filthy garment. While dead, Ninshuber had mourned her mistress and had done everything to bring her back. The demons suggest that Inanna continue on to her city and allow them to take Ninshuber back in Inanna's place. Holy Inanna answered the demons, This is my minister of fair words, my escort of trustworthy words. She did not forget my instructions. She did not neglect the orders I gave her. She made a lament for me on the ruined mounds. She beat the drum for me in the sanctuaries. She made the rounds of the gods' houses for me. She lacerated her eyes for me, lacerated her nose for me. In private, she lacerated her buttocks for me. Like a pauper, she clothed herself in a single garment. She brought me back to life. How could I turn her over to you? Let us go on. Because of her faithfulness and her mourning, Inanna refuses to provide Ninshuber as a substitute and presses on to the city of Uma. There they approach the god Shara. Shara, in his own city, threw himself at her feet. He had sat in the dust and dressed himself in a filthy garment. The demon suggests Shara to be her substitute, but Inanna refuses as Shara had mourned for her. They move on to the city of Bad Tibira, where Lula does the same and is spared as well. They finally reach Inanna's city, where she sees her husband, the shepherd, Demuzi. There was Demuzi, clothed in a magnificent garment and seated magnificently on a throne. Oops, he was not mourning the loss of the goddess, and it cost him. She looked at him. It was the look of death. She spoke to him. It was the speech of anger. She shouted at him. It was the shout of heavy guilt. How much longer? Take him away. Holy Inanna gave Dumuzi the shepherd into their hands. Dumuzi cries out to the sun god Utu, who aids him in his escape, but only temporarily. Dumuzi is ultimately caught by the demons and taken to the netherworld. Inanna wells for her husband, but it is of little use. Dumuzi's sister, Gestiana, ultimately acts as a partial substitute for her brother. You, Dumuzi, for half the year, and your sister for half the year. When you are demanded, on that day you will stay. When your sister is demanded, on that day you will be released. As the story closes, we see that Dumuzi is condemned to be a substitute for Inanna, remaining in the netherworld for half of the year, while his sister, Geshtiana, is to remain for the other half of the year. However, the process by which Demuzi was brought to the land of no return is only briefly described in Inanna's descent. Another myth, known as Demuzi and Geshtiana, describes in greater detail the journey that Demuzi himself took to the netherworld. Demuzi and Geshtiana. The story opens with a conversation being held by two demons. Come on. Let's go to the lap of Holy Inanna. They capture her and attempt to bring her to the netherworld. However, Inanna gives them Dumuzi as her substitute. As for the lad, we will put his feet in footstocks. As for the lad, we will put his hands in handstocks. We will put his neck in neckstocks. They tie his hands and pull his clothing over his head. As in the end of the previous story, Dumuzi cries out to Utu for help. Oh Utu, I am your friend. I am a youth. Do you recognize me? Your sister, whom I married, descended to the underworld. Because she descended to the underworld, it was me that she was to hand over to the underworld as a substitute. Oh Utu, you are a just judge. Don't disappoint me. Change my hands, alter my appearance, so that I might escape the clutches of my demons. 
Don't let them seize me. Like a sankar snake that slithers across the meadows and mountains, let me escape alive to the dwelling of my sister Geshtanana. The sun god Utu hears his prayer. He changed his hands. He altered his appearance. Dumuzi escapes the grasp of the demons and makes it to his sister's house. Seeing her brother, she cries out in lament. Oh my brother, oh my brother, lad who has not fulfilled those days. Oh my brother, shepherd Ama Ushungalana, lad who has not fulfilled those days and years. Oh my brother, lad who has no wife, who has no children. Oh my brother, lad who has no friend, who has no companion. Oh my brother, the lad who is not a comfort to his mother. Meanwhile, the demons have been searching everywhere for Demuzi. Eventually, they surmise that they might be able to deduce where Demuzi is hiding. The small demons say to the big demons, Demons have no mother. They have no father or mother, sister or brother, wife or children. When we're established on heaven and earth, you demons were there at a man's side like a reed enclosure. Demons are never kind. They do not know good from evil. Who has ever seen a man without a family, all alone, escape with his life? We shall go neither to the dwelling of his friends nor to the dwelling of his in-laws. Rather, for the shepherd, let us go to the dwelling of Geshtinana. The demons realize that Demuzi will naturally seek out his sister. Rather than going to his friends or in-laws, they quickly make their way to the home of Geshtiana and demand that she reveal where she is hiding him. Show us where your brother is, they said to her, but she spoke not a word to them. They scratched her face, but she spoke not a word to them. They poured tar in her lap, but she spoke not a word to them. So they could not find Demuzi at the house of Geshtinana. Undeterred, the demons realized that Demuzi would likely go back to the place where he is most comfortable. The small demons said to the big demons, Come on, let's go to the Holy Sheepfold. There at the Holy Sheepfold, they caught Demuzi. They showed him no mercy. The axe was wielded against the lad who had no family. They sharpened their daggers. They smashed his hut. As Demuzi was taken away, his sister wailed for her brother, wandering around mourning his loss. Demuzi's dream. The final Sumerian story that describes the capture of Demuzi and his descent into the netherworld is Demuzi's dream. The story opens with Demuzi roaming the countryside, sobbing uncontrollably. Grieve, grieve, O oh countryside, grieve. O oh countryside, grieve. O oh marshes, cry out. O oh crabs of the river, grieve. O oh frogs of the river, cry out. My mother will call to me. My mother, my Dutor, will call to me. My mother will call to me for five things. My mother will call to me for ten things. If she does not know the day when I am dead, you, O oh countryside, can inform my mother who bore me. Like my little sister, may you weep for me. As was common during this time, people would receive information about the future from the gods through dreams. Demuzi was no exception. When in ancient times the shepherd lay down, he lay down to a dream. He woke up, it was a dream. He shivered, it was sleep. He rubbed his eyes. He was terrified. He called for his sister, Geshtiana, to come and interpret the dream for him. When she arrived, Demuzi recounted in great detail the terrifying dream that he had dreamt. A dream, my sister, a dream. In my dream, rushes were rising up for me. Rushes kept growing for me. A single reed was shaking its head at me. Twin reeds, one was being separated from me. Tall trees in the forest were rising up together over me. Water was poured over my holy coals for me. The cover of my holy churn was removed. My holy drinking cup was torn down from the peg where it hung. My shepherd's stick disappeared from me. An owl took a lamb from the sheep house. A falcon caught a sparrow on the reed fence. My male goats were dragging their dark beards in the dust for me. My rams were scratching the earth with their thick legs for me. The churns were lying on their sides, no milk was being poured. The drinking cups were lying on their sides, Demuzi was dead, the sheepfold was haunted. Let's break down this dream so that we can have a good understanding of the images 
that Dumuzi is describing. One, he sees rushes growing, quote, for him. Two, a single reed shaking its head at him. Three, twin reeds being separated from one another. Four, tall trees rising up over him. Five, water being poured out on his coals. Six, the cover of his butter churn being removed. Seven, his drinking cup pulled off of the peg in the wall where it normally was hung. Eight, his shepherd's stick gone missing. Nine, an owl taking a lamb from the sheepfold. 10. A falcon catching a sparrow on the reed fence. 11. Male goats dragging their beards in the dust. 12. Rams scratching the ground. 13. His butter churns lying on their sides with no milk in them. 14. The drinking cups empty on their sides. 15. Demuzi dead. 16. His sheepfold empty. As you can imagine, none of this bodes well for Demuzi. Gestiana interprets the dream for him. My brother, your dream is not favorable. Don't tell me any more of it. Demuzi, your dream is not favorable. Don't tell me any more of it. The rushes rising up for you, which kept growing for you, are bandits rising against you from their ambush. The single reed shaking its head at you is your mother who bore you, shaking her head for you. The twin reeds of which one was being separated from you is you and I, one will be separated from you. The tall trees in the forest rising up together over you are the evil men catching you within the walls. That water was poured over your holy coals means the sheepfold will become a house of silence. That the cover of your holy churn was removed for you means the evil man will bring it inside in his hands. Your holy drinking cup, torn down from the peg where it hung, is you falling off the lap of the mother who bore you. That your shepherd's stick disappeared from you means the demons will set fire to it. The owl taking a lamb from the sheep house is the evil man who will hit you on the cheek. The falcon catching a sparrow on the reed fence is the big demon coming down from the sheep house. That the churns were lying on their sides. No milk was being poured. The drinking cups were lying on their sides. That Demuzi was dead and the sheepfold was haunted means your hands will be bound in handcuffs. Your arms will be bound in fetters. That your male goats were dragging their dark beards in the dust for you means that my hair will whirl around in the air like a hurricane for you. That your rams were scratching the earth with their thick legs for you means that I shall lacerate my cheeks with my fingernails for you as if with a boxwood needle. It was absolutely an ominous dream. Dumuzi's sacred place, the sheepfold, where he cared for his flock and churned butter and provided milk was to be deserted? Dumuzi was going to be bound and taken to the netherworld by the demons that were going to rise up against him? As soon as Geshtiana finished relaying the bad news, Dumuzi begs her to go up to a high spot and do two things for him. First, he wants her to mourn for him. Sister, when you go up onto the mound, do not go up onto the mound like an ordinary person, but lacerate your heart and your liver, lacerate your clothes and your crotch, sister, and then go up onto the mound. Second, he instructs her to be a lookout for him, as he knew the demons were coming for him. Amageshtanana went up onto the mound and looked around. Geshtanana craned her neck. Her girlfriend, Geshtindudu, advised her. The big men who bind the neck are already coming for him. They are coming for him. Geshtiana warns her brother. My brother, your demons are coming for you. Duck down your head in the grass. Dumuzi runs to hide in the grass and begs his sister not to reveal his hiding place to the demons. He then turns to his friend and similarly begs them not to tell the demons where he is. Both agree to keep the secret. Those who come for the king are a motley crew who know not food, who know not drink, who eat no sprinkled flour, who drink no poured water, who accept no pleasant gifts, who do not enjoy a wife's embraces, who never kiss dear little children, who never chew sharp tasting garlic, who eat no fish, who eat no leeks. The demons then arrive and demand to know where Dumuzi is hiding. They first interrogate his sister. They caught Geshtinana at the sheepfold in Cowpen. They offered her a river of water, but she wouldn't accept it. They offered her a field of grain, but she wouldn't accept it. As in the other stories, Geshtiana wasn't going to turn on her brother. Realizing this, 
The demons then turn to the friend. Who, since the most ancient times, has ever known a sister to reveal her brother's whereabouts? Come, let us go to his friend. Then they offered his friend a river of water, and he accepted it. They offered him a field of grain, and he accepted it. My friend ducked down his head in the grass, thus I don't know his whereabouts. Demuzi had been betrayed. They caught Demuzi in the ditches of Aralee. Demuzi began to weep and was tear-stricken. In the city, my sister saved my life, but my friend caused my death. His hands were bound in handcuffs, his arms were bound in fetters. The lad raised his hands heavenward to Utu. Utu, you are my brother-in-law. I am your sister's husband. I am he who carries food to Ayana. I am he who brought the wedding gifts to Uruk. I am he who kisses the holy lips. I am he who dances on the holy knees, the knees of Inanna. Please change my hands into gazelle hands. Change my feet into gazelle feet so I can evade my demons. Utu answers his prayer, changing Demuzi, and he is able to escape. After chasing and catching him again, Utu aids his escape once more. Demuzi then flees to the home of old woman Belili. Old woman, I am not just a man. I am the husband of a goddess. Would you pour water, please, so I can drink water? Would you sprinkle flour, please, so I can eat flour? She feeds Demuzi and leaves the house where the demons spot her. Her fear tips them off that she knows where Demuzi is hiding and they again capture him in Belili's house. Once again, Utu aids his escape, and he makes it to his sister's sheepfold. When the first demon entered the sheepfold and cowpen, he set fire to the bolt. When the second entered the sheepfold and cowpen, he set fire to the shepherd's stick. When the third entered the sheepfold and cowpen, he removed the cover of the holy churn. When the fourth entered the sheepfold and cowpen, he tore down the drinking cup from the peg where it hung. When the fifth entered the sheepfold and cowpen, the churns lay on their sides. No milk was poured. The drinking cups lay on their sides. Demuzi was dead. The sheepfold haunted. The demons had accomplished their mission, bringing to pass all that Demuzi had dreamed. And that wraps up our look at the pivotal Sumerian myths of Inanna and Demuzi. These stories give us a fascinating glimpse into the beliefs and perspectives of the ancient Sumerians. Inanna's journey to the underworld shows her power and cunning as she cleverly maneuvers to return from the land of the dead. The tragic tale of Demuzi reveals a more human side to the gods, centered around love, loss, and loyalty, and Demuzi's eventual rebirth prefigures later dying and rising deity cults. The themes and symbolism in these myths would go on to influence cultures across the Middle East and Mediterranean for millennia. We see echoes of Inanna and Demuzi in the later myths of Ishtar and Tammuz, Aphrodite and Adonis, Sibylle and Attis. The archetypes of the fertile goddess and her doomed consort appear again and again. I hope this overview has provided insights into these seminal tales and the rich mythology of ancient Sumer. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more analysis of ancient myths and legends from around the world. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more explorations of mythology and religion. Thanks so much for watching, and never forget, we are MythVision.